And that's pretty much what you do. But in more general terms, I'm going to say this. It comes down to geometry, as does the problem you just wanted me to work, and I refuse to work it because I'm way too stupid. No, just don't have time to digest it because there are things I want to really get down here. Okay. Um, and it, Take me a minute or two to read the thing. Um, okay, what's the force in this dam? Okay, in many problems, you just got to look at the geometry and figure out where the thing you are looking at stays constant. Okay, now more specifically. Um, Okay, well, force comes from pressure. Question, where is pressure? Constant. Anytime you set up an integral, you want to know where the thing you're trying to integrate is constant. Okay? Like in the example we just did, the potential difference is constant for given charge, right? Okay? So we partition the charge on the capacitor between zero and whatever the maximum charge is if you want to get the potential energy stored in the capacitor, okay? Um, here, we're asking where's the pressure constant. In this case, there's a geometric answer, right? Okay, where is that? For a given height. Again? For a given height. Yeah. Which is another way of saying it's constant on any plane perpendicular to the gravitational field. I was about to modify that. Now we're going to assume that we're in a region where the gravitational field is constant. Okay, so we assume the dam isn't too high. Well, yeah, we don't build dams high enough that that makes a difference. Okay, so in general, it's constant on e any equal potential surface. Is the Hoover Dam, that's not even high enough that it makes a difference? No, and incidentally, I talked to my brother the other day and told me an interesting story about the Hoover Dam that occurred last month. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll, t I'll tell you about it off camera. Um, I'll tell you that. Nah, nah. Okay, so constant any plane perpendicular gravitational field, and that's called an equal potential surface. An example of an equal potential surface. Gravitational potential energy is uniform on any such plane, right? In other words, you can move from one point of this plane to another, and your gravitational potential energy doesn't change. If I walk on this plane, which is the floor, it's an equal potential surface for gravity, no difference in gravitational potential energy. Okay? Now, as I bounce up and down as I walk, I have a change in gravitational potential energy, but if I stop at any other point on this plane, 
my net change in gravitational potential energy is zero. Okay, well, You want to compare it to the equal potential surface of a point charge? Or a line charge? Or a plane charge? What's the equal potential surface for a point charge? A given distance from the point? Well, it's a sphere concentric with the charge. Yeah. And that's, you know, you, you, you that, you know, at, at a given distance, it's not going to change, right? And that gives you, get, you know, the point, set of points at a given distance from the charge is a sphere concentric with the charge. So equal potential surface is a sphere. Satellites orbit planets on equal potential surfaces. Otherwise, they'd run out of fuel real quick, okay? Um, line charge, what's the equal potential surface for line charge? Cylinder. Yeah. Cylinder. Coaxial with the line. For plane charge? Yeah. A parallel plane. Right? Um, assuming a yeah, infinite plane charge or that you're close, much closer to the plane distribution than to the edges. Right? So just putting this into a broader context because you have to do integrals for these things too. You've done the integral for changing orbits. Potential energy change from one distance to the other. But you're essentially just integrating one over r squared. Times a constant, gravitational constant, mass. Okay, okay so uh, this is a simpler case. But of course the geometry of the situation, you've got this irregular Boundary, okay. Let's try to think of a better word, but it may, oh, it's a boundary. That's a general term, okay. So, equal potential surface these are your gravitational equal potentials. And they're actually just, you know, small sections of spheres around the center of the Earth. But on this scale, you can't even detect the curvature, okay? Actually, you could if you had sensitive enough instruments, but it's not going to make any difference in the design of that blame down, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not going to make a Newton of difference, I don't think in the net force, okay? In the millions, billions of millions. Okay, so what do we partition? We begin by partitioning say an axis perpendicular to the equal potentials. If you're partitioning an axis perpendicular to the equal potentials uh, between two points for different Earth orbits, well you're going to let your axis be a radial line, right? Okay. You could think about what you would use if you wanted to do an equal partition for a magnetic field. Or for the electrostatic equal potentials that you measured in the water in lab last time. 
Okay? Those were equal tensions. If you want to figure out the change in potential from here to here along this path, let that path be perpendicular to equal potentials, and you get the potential difference. Of course, I already knew what the potential difference was. You just put the electrodes on the two, or right next to the two. Um, you, you put your voltmeter, yeah, uh, right next to the uh, uh, electrodes or terminals. Okay, anyhow, general principle. What do you partition? Okay? If you can incorporate that whole concept, because it's the central concept of setting up any integral, to summing anything where you have variable quantities, uh, better off. Now, you also have to partition parameterizations and stuff, as Elam loves. Um, and you haven't gotten to that yet because you haven't done multivariable calculus, line integrals and stuff. But the whole principle is still pretty much the same, okay? Except it's different. Okay, so, what do you, what, what, that means what do you partition? In this case, it's a vertical axis. So here you've got your vertical axis. And where do you put the zero point? Well, if this surface is weird enough here, you're going to have to put it at a point where you really know. So we'll let y equal zero here. It's not necessary. You could let do it here. You can do it anywhere. Doesn't matter. Okay? And then, okay, you partition this, so here's a typical interval of the partition. And in the typical interval, what are your parameters? Well, it's automatically going to be a y, but it's going to be a y i star. You just start with a y i star. You assume you got n sub intervals, you take the typical interval, right? So you're going to have a strip I said at y i star, I should have said containing y i star, right? But I used a shorter word because I don't have a lot of room because I don't plan very well. Okay? It could be a width delta y sub i. If you have a uniform width, then you could just use delta y, but you don't necessarily have to have uniform width. Okay, yeah, but if you want to assume uniform width for what we're doing, that's fine. It's almost always fine anyway. Okay, so here's your typical partition. And it's a typical typical interval in the partition. Your partition is all of them, right? Okay, this typical interval in the partition, you know you've got the other intervals. Now from, so, okay, then we have, well that's a bad color because it looks like the other one, I'll use something to contrast. Okay, your interval is the orange thing on the y-axis, but here is a near equipotential strip, right? Okay, so you have a near equipotential strip.
corresponding to the i-th interval. Okay. Now, I did something here. I let the y-axis be vertical upward because that's what we typically do. I realize now that I'd be better off pointing my y-axis downward because when I go to figure out what the pressure is here, I'm going to have a negative value of y which I'm going to have to subtract from zero and then multiply by density to get my pressure. Okay? And, you know, gravitational constant stuff. And, or the, yeah, not the gravitational constant, the gravitational acceleration. Anyhow, if I do this, I don't have to worry about subtracting it. Whatever my y is, that's how deep I am, right? So now, on this interval, the pressure, at least the water pressure, This would be a gauge pressure measured from relevant, relative to the top of the dam. The water pressure is rho g y sub i star, approximate. on the strip is area sub i times rho g y sub i. And what's area sub i? It's width sub i. By that I mean the width of the strip, or I'll just say the length of the strip. I want to think of that as width, but length is a better word, because then you can regard this as width. This being much less than this, that makes more sense. Okay? Now, your length sub i depends on what kind of boundary you've got, okay? If it's a semicircular boundary, you use a little trigonometry, okay? If it's a trapezoid, you know, you, you, you have to figure that out. That's just a simple geometric problem, not always simple. But that's a function of y. So it's going to be L of y sub i times del of y sub i times rho g y sub i. Then your sum approaches an integral that we can pretty easily write down. And the integral would be like L of y times y dy, and then the rho g should come out in front. Okay. Now it depends on the geometry of the boundary, what the L of Y is, but hopefully that's an easy thing to figure out. <laughs>